This time we're gonna do a knife that is not so crazy. Um, it's not gonna be some like 90s mecha Evangelion sci-fi Sauron Game of Thrones knife. So a bit ago, I started talking with Julian Solomita. I don't know how it happened, but we started talking about knives and he's like, he was interested in a knife. I was like, dude, let's do like a giant kitchen sword or something like that or like this big ass kitchen axe because these are extremely practical for everyday kitchen use. Well, we decided to do something actually normal. So, eight inch, oops, eight inch, eight inch, <laughs> eight inch stainless, um, pretty straightforward. This is gonna be a really good all around kitchen knife. So it's got a little flat section back here for, for the pull and push cuts and then a good rocking motion towards the front. Um, let's see what else I'm talking about. So this has already been profiled and heat treated. It's a stainless blank and it is now ready for rough grinding, finishing, and then doing the handle and sharpening. So these holes back here, they are drilled because it lightens, it lightens up the tang so that it balances more around where you're pinching. And it, it also helps with the epoxy adhesion. So you get epoxy going from one side of the handle to the other. It's ready for rough grinding, so we're gonna do that now. First thing I do on any knife is establish my center lines. This is the foundation of the entire build and if they're done right from the beginning, every other step forward is that much easier. Even on blades that are slightly warped, you can scribe a center line straight down the middle and adjust accordingly. If I don't do this, I'll be fighting the build throughout the entire process. For the edge, I do one single line down the middle, then grind a 45 degree bevel right up to it. That gives me a visual reference on how far to grind, and it also breaks the harsh edge so I don't destroy a brand new belt when I go to grind. For the spine, I do a similar process, but instead of grinding all the way up to the line, I'm grinding the profile of the taper that I want. For me, it doesn't really have to be perfect since I re-evaluate my center throughout the process. A better maker would be more efficient than me, they would just do it in one line from the beginning, and then not fuss with it at all later on. I rough grind using a work rest and a push stick. This is a technique taught by Master Smith Tim Hancock, and I really like it a lot because all of my energy is directed into the blade instead of having to hold up the knife. I don't need to worry about burning my fingers. To address heat buildup when grinding, I use fresh abrasives and I moderate my speed and pressure depending on where I'm grinding. The last thing I want is to accidentally overheat the steel and ruin the heat treatment. When removing the bulk material, I have a lot of steel there and it doesn't heat up as fast. I can lean into it and move slower, thus removing more material. When I work towards the edge and the tip, there's less mass there and it will heat up much quicker. Now I reduce my pressure and move the knife along faster. With a fresh lower grit belt, there's basically minimal heat buildup. When I'm almost done with my rough grinding, I will actually sharpen the edge on the disc grinder and kick up a burr, which I'll explain in a second. This process lets me really dial in the edge and get it as straight as I can. This is one of the most important parts of a high-end kitchen knife and it's what a lot of people struggle with when they try making one. A straight, thin edge. Same thing as when I ground the 45s earlier to that line. This is giving me another visual reference of how far I need to go. When you sharpen a knife, you are removing material as well as moving material. This results in the burr. It's a flap of steel that forms on the opposite side of where you're removing metal. I'm aiming to remove enough to hit the actual edge of the knife and kick up a burr all the way along the profile of the edge and be able to flip it back and forth on either side of the blade. This way I know I have successfully sharpened the whole edge and I don't need to worry about how close or how thin I'm getting from this point on. After I've sharpened up the edge, I thin it out even further and start creeping up closer to that edge. This is why sharpening is so important at this early stage in the process. I basically take the guesswork out of thinning the knife. I break my grind into multiple sections, then blend them together into a full convex grind. This is just something I do to help make it a little bit more repeatable on a geometry that's hard to explain without being able to feel it. I test my knives and potatoes. Not only do I love potatoes, they're fantastic at telling you how well your knives perform overall. 
Ideally, if you're really dialing in a geometry, you should probably cut more than just potatoes, but over time and some experience, I have a pretty good idea on how well a knife will perform on various foods based on how it cuts a potato. Basically, what I've got going on is a full height, slight convex grind with a forced distal taper. This means nothing is flat on there, and as you go from the heel towards the tip, the angle gets more and more acute. This type of geometry is really nice because you have some beef at the heel when you need to do some hard work, and you have a nice tip to do more finesse work. It excels at push and pull cuts because the geometry is changing as you're doing your motions. What I'm aiming for on this knife is an all-around solid home chef's knife. I don't want it to be too thin, I don't want it to be too thick. I want it to release food pretty easily so that potatoes and stuff don't stick so hard to the surface, but I don't want it to wedge anything severely. It's always a fine balance, a trade-off of sorts. When it cuts through a potato with ease and it takes very little effort to shake it off, I'm good. When I have my geometry all finalized and things are looking pretty tight, it's time to make things look pretty. We're going to do a dirty finish now, meaning it's all the same grit, but the scratch pattern doesn't have to be totally perfect. All we're doing right now is checking for flaws and irregularities. Hopefully we've done a good job, but there are times where there might be a dip, wave, ripple, booger, or whatever in the grind that we have to even out. Here you can see some ripples in the surface of the blade that we need to flatten out. Before I do the finishing touches on the blade, I get the handle started. We're going to cut the block into scales, flatten them, drill the holes, then shape the front. Normally, I would keep the orientation to keep the grain going from one side to the other. On these, I want to keep a little bit of that sapwood, so I'm inverting the scales. I drill a lot of extra blind holes to help as a sort of mechanical fastening. When epoxy fills all these holes and fully hardens, it's going to be much stronger than just a flat surface on a flat surface. I use the pins to index them together, profile the front so both of them match, then grind in those angles. I reference them to each other and check my eye to make sure they're as symmetrical as possible. If the scales were the same thickness and everything was square, this is pretty easy. The fronts are hand sanded and finished completely before the handle is glued because after it's glued, you can't finish that area. When the front of the handle is done, I use that to mark it on the knife so I know where to start rounding the spine and choil. Now that I have the front of the handle marks, I can round out these interface areas so that they're comfortable. This is critical for ergonomics and if we're making a knife by hand, it's such an easy step that it seems silly to not do it. I try to get the rounded area to terminate right at where I marked the start of the handle. Too short and there's gonna be a sharp area where the hand goes, too far and now there's a sloppy gap. Now we sign the blade, pretty straightforward. I use a stencil and this electro etcher I made a long time ago. It sends some electrons one way, the stencil does some things, and then electricity eats away at the steel. Flip the polarity and now it darkens the signature. I check periodically to make sure it's marking evenly and to see if anything weird is happening. After all the shaping is done and the signature is marked, it's time to finish the blade. What I'm going for is to have all the scratches as uniform as possible going in the same direction. I don't want to sand back and forth because that's sloppy and you get these things called J hooks. Up to this point, I want all of the previous scratches of lower grits to be gone. This is purely an aesthetic thing, but it's important. To attach the handle, I'm doing one visible pin in front and one hidden pin towards the rear, plus some blind holes in there to make sure everything is adhered together. The epoxy with all the blind holes will keep things together, and then the pins are there to prevent shearing. For the glue itself, everything must be clean. The blade is cleaned with acetone to get any major oil off, then dish soap and water to make sure there's no residue on there. The epoxy has to be measured out to make sure the ratios are right. Now apply glue, wipe off the excess, clean the front of the handle before it fully sets, and let it cure overnight to shape the handle the next day. To shape the handle, like anything else, I set a foundation. 
A lot of it has been done already. The center lines, setting up the tapers so that everything's straight, and then the handles being flat and all the same thickness. Now I clean the outer profile and get that to 1200 grit. I do the top corners, then match the bottom to the middle line, finish those up, and then round the bottom. If all that is good, then I do the final taper. Finishing is pretty straightforward. I sand it to 1200 grit, and I use a hard-backed sanding stick to keep the lines crisp. Finish with oil, let it fully harden. Sharpening fundamentals. All it is is you're removing material until you've hit the true edge. You create a burr, and then you remove that burr and refine the edge. That's all. The trick is to know how much to take off. When you have removed enough material to hit that edge, you will get a burr. Like I said earlier, the burr is a little flap of metal that hangs off the edge. It forms on the opposite side of where you're removing. You want to be able to feel the burr all the way from the heel to the tip, then be able to flip that burr and feel it all the way on the other side. Now you know you've taken off enough material. From there, it's just burr removal and refinement. There's a billion different ways to remove the burr. You can strop the knife back and forth. You can draw it through softwood, through cork. I've heard about people flapping it on a magazine or whatever. The goal is to get a clean, sharp edge with no burr or wire edge on there. This way you're getting a nice, strong edge that's gonna last a long time. I'm taking this edge up to 1500 grit. That's a great point to stop because it performs really well and I don't want it too sharp. In a very general explanation, the sharper the edge, the quicker it is it can dull and the harder it is to maintain. And that's it on making a kitchen knife. That was a lot. I tried to explain it as best as I could without getting too technical, but I hope you enjoy the video in the process. Here are some glamour shots. So this is a bit of a little surprise that I'm putting on this knife. Julian actually doesn't know this is gonna be on here. Um, if you've seen Julian's or Jenna's stuff, you'll know what Ari's kitchen is. So I thought it'd be a pretty fun idea to put this surprise in there. So this is one of one Ari's kitchen series of Don Wynn knives. Thank you.